Chapter 7 It was the day of the feast. Since noon, I had been under the ministrations of Ritimi and Tutemi, who took great trouble to beautify me. With a sharpened piece of bamboo, Tutemi cut my hair in the customary style, and with a knife sharp, grass blade, she shaved the crown of my head. The hair on my legs she removed with an abrasive paste made from ashes, vegetable resin, and dirt. Ritimi painted wavy lines across my face and intricate geometric patterns over my entire body with a piece of chewed-up twig. My legs, red and swollen from the dep- depilation, were left unpainted. On my looped earrings, which I claimed could not be removed, she tied a pink flower together with tufts of white feathers. Around my upper arms, wrists, and ankles, she fastened red cotton strands. Oh no, you're not going to do that, I said, jumping out of Ritimi's reach. It won't hurt, she assured me, then asked in an exasperated manner, Do you want to look like an old woman? It won't hurt. Ritimi insisted, coming after me. Leave her alone, Ituwa said, reaching for a bark box on the loft. He looked at me, then burst into laughter. His big white teeth, his squinting eyes, seemed to mock my embarrassment. She doesn't have much pubic hair. Gratefully, I tied the red cotton belt Ritimi had given me around my hips and laughed with them. Making sure I fastened the wide, flat belt in such a manner that the fringed ends covered the offending hair, I said to Ritimi, Now you can't see a thing. Ritimi was not impressed, but gave an indifferent shrug and continued examining her pubis for any hair. Dark circles and arabesques decorated Ituwa's brown face and body. Over his waistband, he tied a thick round belt made of red cotton yarn. Around his upper arms, he fastened narrow bands of monkey fur, to which Ritimi attached the black and white feathers Ituwa had selected from the bark box. Dipping her fingers in the sticky resin paste one of Arasuwe's wives had prepared in the morning, Ritimi wiped them over Itiwa's hair. Immediately, Tutemi took a handful of white down feathers from another box and plastered them on his head until he looked as if he were wearing a white fur cap. When will the feast start? I asked, watching a group of men haul away enormous piles of plantain skins from the already cleaned Weed-free clearing. When the plantain soup and all the meat is ready, Ituwa said, strutting about, making sure we could see him from every angle. His lips were twisted in a smile, and his humorous eyes were still squinted. He looked at me, then removed the wad of tobacco from his mouth, placing it on a piece of broken calabash on the ground. He spat over his hammock in a sharp, strong arc. With the assurance of someone who feels pleased and delighted with his own looks, he turned toward us once more, then walked out of the hut. Little Tashoma picked up the slimy quid. Stuffing it into her mouth, she began to suck on it with the same gratification I would have felt biting into a piece of chocolate. Her small face, disfigured with half of the wad protruding from her mouth, looked grotesque. Grinning, she climbed into my hammock and promptly fell asleep. In the next hut, I could see the headman Arasuwe lying in his hammock. From there, he supervised the cooking of plantains and the roasting of the meat brought by the hunters who had left a few days before. Like workers on an assembly line, several men had in record time 
disposed of the numerous bundles of plantains. One sank his sharp teeth into the peel, cutting it open. Another pried the hard skin away, then threw the fruit into the bark, trough, Etua had built early that morning. A third watched over the three small fires he had lit underneath. How come only men are cooking? I asked Tutemi. I knew women never cooked large game, but I was baffled that none of them had gotten close to the plantains. Women are too careless, Arasue answered for Tutemi as he stepped into the hut. His eyes seemed to challenge me to contradict his statement. Smiling, he added, they get distracted too easily and let the fire burn through the bark. Before I had a chance to say anything, he was back in his hammock. Did he only come in to say that? No, Ritimi said. He came to look you over. I was reluctant to ask if I had passed Arasue's inspection, lest I remind her of my unplucked pubic hair. Look, I said, visitors are arriving. That's Puriwariwe, Angelica's oldest brother, Ritimi said, pointing to an old man among the group of men. He is a feared Shapori. He was killed once, but didn't die. Killed once, but didn't die? I repeated this slowly, wondering if I was supposed to take it literally or if it was a figure of speech. Killed in a raid, Itua said, walking into the hut. Dead, 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 but didn't die. He spoke distinctly, moving his lips in an exaggerated manner, as if he could thus make me understand the true meaning of his words. Are there still raids taking place? No one answered my question. Ituwa reached for a long, hollow cane and a small gourd, hidden behind one of the rafters, then left us to greet the visitors who stood in the middle of the clearing, facing Arasue's hut. More men walked into the compound, and I wondered aloud if any women had been invited to the feast. They are outside, Ritimi said, when the rest of the guests decorating themselves while the men take a pina. The head man, Arasue, his brother, Iramamoe, Ituwa, and six other Itikoteri men, all decorated with feathers, fur, and red anoto paste, squatted face to face with the visitors, who were already on their haunches. They talked for a while, avoiding one another's eyes. Arasue unfastened the small gourd hanging around his neck, poured some of the brownish-green powder into one end of his hollow cane, then faced Angelica's brother. Placing the end of the cane against the shaman, the shaman's nose, Arasue blew the hallucinogenic powder with great force into one of the old man's nostrils. The shaman did not flinch, groan, or stagger off, as I had seen other men do. But his eyes did become bleary, and soon green slime dripped from his nose and mouth, which he flicked away with a twig. Slowly, he began to chant. I did not catch his words. They were spoken too softly, and the groans of the others drowned them out. Glassy-eyed, with mucus and saliva dripping down his chin and chest, Arasue jumped into the air. The red macaw feathers hanging from his ears and arms fluttered around him. He jumped repeatedly, touching the ground with a lightness that seemed incredible in someone so stockily built. His face seemed to be carved in stone. Straight bangs hung over a jutting brow. The wide, flaring nose, the snarling mouth, 
reminded me of one of the four guardian kings I had once seen in a temple in Japan. A few of the men had staggered away from the rest of the group, holding their heads as they vomited. The old man's chant became louder. One by one, the men gathered once more around him. Quietly, they squatted, their folded arms over their knees, their eyes lost on some invisible spot only they could see until the Shapori finished his song. Each of the Ikoteri men returned to his hut accompanied by a guest. Arasue had invited Puriwariwe. Itua walked into his hut with one of the young men who had vomited. Without glancing at us, the guest stretched in Itua's hammock as if it were his own. He did not look older than sixteen. Why didn't all the Ikoteri men take a pina or decorate themselves? I whispered to Ritimi, who was busy cleaning and repainting Itua's face with Anoto. Tomorrow they all will be decorated. More guests will come in the next few days, she said. Today is for Angelica's relatives. But Milagros isn't here. He came this morning. This morning? I repeated in disbelief. The young man lying in Itua's hammock opened his eyes wide, looked at me, then shut them again. Deshoma awoke and began to wail. I tried to calm her by pushing the tobacco quid, which had fallen to the ground, back into her mouth. Refusing it, she began to cry even louder. I handed her to Tutemi, who rocked the child back and forth until she was still. Why had me not Milagros not let me know he was back? I wondered feeling angry and hurt. Tears of self-pity welled up in my eyes. Look, he's coming, Tutemi said, pointing toward the Shabono's entrance. Followed by a group of men, women, and children, Milagros walked directly toward Arasue's hut. Red and black lines circled his eyes and mouth. Spellbound, I gaped at the black monkey tail wrapped around his head, from which multicolored macaw feathers dangled, matching ones that hung from his fur armbands. Instead of the festive cotton belt, he wore a bright red loincloth. An inexplicable uneasiness overtook me as he approached my hammock. I felt my heart pound with fear as I gazed up into his tense, strained face. Bring your gourd, he said in Spanish, then turned around and walked toward the trough filled with plantain soup. Without paying the slightest attention to me, everyone followed Milagros into the clearing. Speechless, I reached for my basket, set it on the ground before me, and took out all my possessions. At the bottom, wrapped in my knapsack, was the smooth, osher-colored calabash with Angelica's ashes. I had often wondered what I was supposed to do with it. Ritimi had never touched the knapsack when she went through my belongings. The gourd felt heavy in my stiff, cold hands. It had been so light when I had carried it tied around my waist in the forest. Empty it into the trough, Milagro said. Again, he spoke in Spanish. It's filled with soup, I said stupidly. I felt my voice quiver and my hands were so unsteady. I thought I would not be able to pull the resin plug from the calabash. Empty it, Milagros repeated tilting my arm gently. I squatted awkwardly and slowly poured the burnt, finely powdered bones into the soup. I stared hypnotically at the dark heap they formed on the thick yellow surface. 
The smell made me nauseous. The ashes did not submerge. Milagros poured the contents of his own gourd on top of them. The women began to wail and cry. Was I supposed to join them? I wondered. I felt certain no matter how hard I tried, not a single tear would come to my eyes. Startled by sharp, crackling sounds, I straightened up. With the handle of his machete, Milagros had split the two gourds into perfect, perfect halves. Next, he mixed the powder into the soup, blending it so well that the yellow pot pap turned into a dirty gray. I watched him bring the soup-filled gourd to his mouth, then empty it in one long gulp. Wiping his chin with the back of his hand, he filled it once more and handed the ladle to me. Horrified, I looked at the faces around me. Intently, they watched every movement and gesture I made with eyes that no longer seemed human. The women had stopped wailing. I could hear the accelerated beats of my heart. Swallowing repeatedly in an effort to overcome the dryness in my mouth, I held out a shaking hand. Then I shut my eyes tightly and gulped down the heavy liquid. To my surprise, the sweet, slightly salty soup glided smoothly down my throat. A faint smile relaxed Milagro's tense face as he took the empty gourd from me. I turned around and slowly walked away as ripples of nausea tightened my stomach. High-pitched chatter and squeals of laughter issued from the hut. Sisiwe, surrounded by his friends, sat on the ground, showing them each one of my personal belongings, which I had left scattered around. My nausea dissolved into rage as I saw my notepad smoldering on the hearth. Startled, the children laughed at me as I burned my fingers trying to retrieve what was left of the pads. Slowly, the bemused expressions on their faces changed to amazement when they realized I was crying. I ran out of the shabono, down the path toward the river, clutching the burnt pages to my breast. I'll ask Milagros to take me back to the mission, I mumbled, wiping the tears from my face. The idea struck me as so absurd that I burst out laughing. How could I face Father Coriolano with a shaven tonsure? Squatting at the edge of the water, I stuck my finger in my throat and tried to vomit. It was no use. Exhausted, I lay face up on a flat boulder jutting over the water and examined what was left of my notes. A cool breeze blew my hair. I turned on my stomach. The warmth of the stone filled me with a soft laziness that melted all my anger and weariness away. I looked for my face in the clear water, but the wind ruffled away all reflection from the surface. The river gave back nothing. Trapped in the dark pools along the bank, the brilliant green of the vegetation was a cloudy mass. Let your notes drift with the river, Milagro said, sitting beside me on the rock. His sudden presence did not startle me. I had been expecting him. With a slight movement of my head, I silently assented and let my hand dangle over the rock. My fingers unclasped. I heard a faint splash as the scorched pad fell into the water. I felt as if a burden had been lifted off my back as I watched my notes drift downriver. 
You didn't go to the mission, I said. Why didn't you tell me you had to bring Angelica's relatives? Milagros did not answer, but stared out across the river. Did you tell the children to burn my notes? I asked. He turned his face toward me, but remained silent. The contraction of his mouth revealed a vague disillusionment. I failed to comprehend. When he spoke at last, it was in a soft tone that seemed forced from him against his will. The Itikoteri, as well as other settlements, have moved over the years deeper and deeper into the forest, away from the mission and the big rivers where the white man passes by. He turned to look at a lizard crawling uneasily over the stone. For an instant, it stared at us with lidless eyes, then slithered off. Other settlements have chosen to do the opposite, Milagros continued. They seek the goods, the rationales, offer. They have failed to understand that only the forest can give them security. Too late, they will discover that to the white man, the Indian is no better than a dog. He knew, he said, having lived all his life between the two worlds, that the Indians did not have a chance in the world of the white man no matter what a few individuals of either race did or believed to the contrary. I talked about anthropologists and their work, the importance of recording customs and beliefs, which, as he had mentioned on a previous occasion, were doomed to be forgotten. The hint of a mocking smile twisted his lips, I know about anthropologists. I once worked for one of them as an informant, he said, and began to laugh. It was a high-pitched laughter, but there was no emotion in his face. His eyes were not laughing, but shone with animosity. I was taken aback because his anger seemed directed at me. You knew I was an anthropologist, I said hesitantly. You yourself helped me fill part of my notebook with information about the Itikoteri. It was you who took me from hut to hut, who encouraged others to talk to me, to teach me your language and your customs. Impassively, Milagro sat there, his painted face an expressionless mask. I felt like shaking him. It was as if he had not heard my words. Milagro stared at the trees, already black against the fading sky. I looked up into his face. His head was silhouetted against the sky. I saw the flaming macaw feathers and purple manes of monkey fur as if the sky were streaked with them. Milagro shook his head, sadly. You know you didn't come here to do your work. You could have done that much better at one of the settlements close to the mission. Tears formed at the edge of his eyelids. They clung to his stubby lashes, shining, trembling. Knowledge of our ways and beliefs was given to you so you would move with the rhythm of our lives, so you would feel secure and protected. It was a gift not to be used or to be given to others. I could not shift my gaze away from his bright, moist eyes. There was no resentment in them. I saw my face mirrored in his black pupils, Angelica's and Milagro's gift. I finally understood. 
I had been guided through the forest, not to see their people with the eyes of an anthropologist, sifting, judging, analyzing all I saw and heard, but to see them as Angelica would have seen them for one last time. She too had known that her time and the time of her people was coming to an end. I shifted my gaze to the water. I had not felt my watch falling in the river, but there it was lying amidst the pebbles. An unstable vision of tiny illuminated spots coming together and moving apart in the water. One of the metal links on the watch band must have broken, I thought, but made no effort to retrieve the watch. My last link with the world beyond the forest. Milagro's voice broke into my reveries. A long time ago at a settlement close to the big river, I worked for an anthropologist. He didn't live with us in the Shabono, but built himself a hut outside the long palisade. It had walls and a door that locked from the inside and the outside. Milagros paused for a moment, wiping the tears that had dried around his wrinkled eyes, then asked me, Do you want to know what I did to him? Yes, I said hesitantly. I gave him a pina. Milagros paused for a moment and smiled as if he were enjoying my apprehension. This anthropologist acted like everyone else who inhaled the sacred powder. He said he had the same visions as the shaman. There's nothing strange about that, I said, a little picked by Milagro's smug tone. Yes, there is, he said, and laughed. Because all I blew up his nostrils were ashes. All ashes do is make your nose bleed. Is that what you're going to give me? I asked, and flushed at the obvious self-pity that permeated my voice. I gave you part of Angelica's soul, he said softly, helping me to my feet. The Shabono's boundaries seemed to dissolve against the darkness. I could see well in the faint light. The people gathered around the trough reminded me of forest creatures. Their shining eyes smeared with the light from the fires. I sat next to Hayama and accepted the piece of meat she offered me. Ritimi rubbed her head against my arm. Little Tashoma sat in my lap. I felt content, protected by the familiar odors and sounds. Intently, I watched the faces around me, wondering how many of them were related to Angelica. There was not a single face resembling hers. Even Milagro's features, which had once seemed so much like Angelica's, looked different. Perhaps I had already forgotten what she looked like, I thought sadly. Then, on a beam of light extending from the fire, I saw her smiling face. I shook my head, trying to erase the vision. I found myself staring at the old shaman, Puriwariwe, squatting a bit apart from the group. He was a small, thin, dried-up man with a brownish-yellow skin. The muscles of his arms and legs were already shrunken, but his hair was still dark, curling slightly around his head. He was not adorned. All he wore was a bowstring around his waist. Sparse hairs hung from his chin, and the vestiges of a mustache shadowed the edges of his upper lip. Under heavy wrinkled lids, his eyes were like tiny lights, reflecting the gleam of the fire. 
Yawning, he opened a cavernous mouth where yellow teeth hung like stalagmites. Laughter and conversation ceased as he began to chant in a voice that gave the impression of belonging to another time and place. He possessed two voices. The one coming from his throat was high-pitched and wrathful. The other coming from his belly was deep and soothing. Long after everyone had retired to their hammocks and the fires had burned down, Puriwariwe remained crouched in front of a small fire in the middle of the clearing. He sang in a low-keyed voice. I got up from my hammock and squatted next to him, trying to bring my buttocks to touch the earth. According to the Itikoteri, it was the only way one could squat for hours and be totally relaxed. Puriwariwe looked at me, acknowledging my gaze, then stared into space as though I had disturbed his train of thought. He did not move, and I had the odd sensation he had fallen asleep. Then he shifted his buttocks on the ground, without relaxing his legs, and gradually began to chant once more, in a voice that was but a faint murmur. I was not able to understand a single word. It began to rain, and I returned to my hammock. The drops pattered softly onto the thatched palm roof, creating a strange trance-like rhythm. When I looked again toward the center of the clearing, the old man had disappeared. And as dawn lit up the forest, I felt myself slip into a timeless sleep. Chapter 8 The red sunset tinted the air with a fiery glow. The sky was aflame for a few minutes before it dissolved rapidly into darkness. It was the third day of the feast. From my hammock, together with Ituas and Arasue's children, I watched the sixty or so men, Itikoteri as well as other as well as their guests, who without food or rest had been dancing since noon in the middle of the clearing. To the rhythm of their own shrill shouts, to the clacking of their bows and arrows, they turned one way then another, stepping backward and forward, a throbbing, never-ending beat of sound and motion an undulating array of feathers and bodies, a blur of crimson and black designs. A full moon rose above the treetops, casting a radiant light over the clearing. For a moment there was a lull in the unceasing noise and movement. Then the dancers broke out in savage, strangled cries that filled the air with an ear-piercing sound as they flung aside their bows and arrows. Running inside the huts, the dancers grabbed burning logs from the hearths and with a frenzied violence banged them against the poles holding up the shabono. All sorts of crawling insects scurried for safety in the palm-thatched roof before they fell like a cascade to the ground. Terrified that the huts might come crashing down, or that the flying embers might set the roofs on fire, I ran outside with the children. The earth trembled under the men's stomping feet as they trampled out all the hearths in the huts. Brandishing the lighted logs high above their heads, they ran out into the center of the clearing and resumed their dance with mounting frenzy. They circled the plaza, their heads wagging back and forth like marionettes whose strings had broken. 
the soft white feathers in their hair fluttered onto their sweat-glistening shoulders. The moon moved behind a black cloud. Only the sparks of the fiery logs illuminated the clearing. The men's shrill cries rose to a higher pitch. Wielding their clubs overhead, they invited the women to join in the, the dance. Shouting and laughing, the women darted back and forth, expertly dodging the swinging logs. The frenzy of the dancers mounted to a compelling intensity, converging toward a final climax as young girls, holding clusters of yellow palm fruit in their upraised arms, joined the crowd, their bodies swaying with sensual abandon. I was not sure if it was Ritimi who grabbed my hand and pulled me into the dance, for in the next instant I stood along, I stood alone among the ecstatic faces whirling around me. Caught between shadows and bodies, I tried to reach old Hayama standing in the safety of a hut, but did not know in which direction to move. I did not recognize the man who, brandishing a log above his head, pushed me back amidst the dancers. I cried out, terror-stricken. I realized it was as if my cries were mute. Exhausted and countless echoes reverberating inside me, I felt a sharp pain on the side of my head, right behind my ear, as I fell face down on the ground. I opened my eyes, trying to see through the shadows thickening about me, and wondered if those frenzied feet, whirling and leaping in the air, realized I had fallen amidst them. Then there was darkness, punctuated by pinpoints of light darting in and out of my head like glowworms in the night. I was vaguely aware of someone dragging me away from the trampling dancers to a hammock. I forced my eyes open, but the figure hovering above me remained blurred. I felt a pair of gentle, slightly shaky hands touch my face, the back of my head. For an instant, I thought it was Angelica. But upon hearing that unmistakable voice coming from the depths of his stomach, I knew it was the old shaman, Puriwariwe, chanting. I tried to focus my eyes, but his face remained distorted, as if I were seeing it through layers of water. I wanted to ask him where he had been for I had not seen him since the first day of the feast. But the words were nothing but visions in my head. I don't know whether I had been unconscious or whether I had slept, but when I awoke, Puri Rawiwe was no longer there. Instead, I saw Itua's face behind, Itua's face bending over mine. So close, I could have touched the red circles on his cheeks, between his brows and at the corners of each eye. I stretched out my arm, but there was no one there. I shut my eyes. The circles danced inside my head like a red veil in a dark void. I shut them tighter until the image broke into a thousand fragments. The fire had been relit. It filled the hut with a cozy warmth that made me feel as if I were wrapped in an opaque cocoon of smoke. Dancing shadows silhouetted against the darkness were reflected on the golden patina of gourds hanging from the rafters. Laughing happily, Old Hayama came into the hut and sat on the ground beside me. I thought you would sleep till morning. Raising both his hands to my head. Raising both hands to my head, her fingers probed until she found the swollen lump behind my ear. 
It's big, she said. Her weathered features expressed a distant sorrow. Her eyes held a soft, gentle light. I sat up in the fiber hammock. Only then did I realize I was not in Itua's hut. Iramamowes, Ayama said, before I had a chance to ask where I was. His hut was the closest for Puriwari way to bring you in after you were pushed against one of the men's clubs. The moon had traveled high in the sky. Its pale shimmer spilled into the clearing. The dancing had ceased, yet an inaudible vibration still hung in the air. Shouting, clacking their bows and arrows, a group of men positioned themselves in a semicircle in front of the hut. Iramamowe and one of the visitors stepped into the center of the gesticulating men. I could not tell which settlement the guest was from. I had been unable to distinguish the various groups who had come and gone since the beginning of the feast. Iramamowe spread his legs in a firm stance, raised his left arm over his head, exposing his chest fully. Ha ha! Ah ha Aita, Aita, he shouted, tapping his foot on the ground, a fearless cry that was meant to dare his opponent to strike him. The young visitor adjusted his distance by measuring his arm length to Iramamowe's body. He took several dry runs, then with his closed fist delivered one powerful blow on the left side of Iramamowe's chest. My body recoiled in shock. I felt nauseous, as though the pain had swept through my own chest. Why are they fighting? I asked Hayama. They aren't fighting, she said laughing. They want to hear how their hikuras, the life essence that dwells inside their chests, resound. They want to hear how the hikuras vibrate with each blow. The crowd cheered enthusiastically. The young visitor stood back, his chest heaving with excitement, and punched Iramamoe once more. Chin arrogantly raised, eyes perfectly steady, body stiff in defiance. Iramamoe acknowledged the cheers of the men. It was only after the third blow that he broke his stance. For an instant, his lips parted in an appreciative grin, then set once more in a snarl of indifference and contempt. The persistent tapping of his foot, Hayama assured me, revealed nothing other than annoyance. His adversary had not yet struck him hard enough. With a morbid, righteous kind of satisfaction, I hoped... Iramamoe felt the pain of each blow. He deserved it, I thought. Ever since I had seen him strike his wife, I had built up a resentment against him. Yet, as I watched, I could not help but admire the gallant way, gallant way, he stood in the middle of the crowd. There was something childishly defiant in the ramrod straightness of his back the manner in which his bruised chest was thrust forward, his round, flat face, with its narrow forehead and flared upper lip, appeared so vulnerable as he stared at the young man in front of him. I wondered if the slight flicker of his brown eyes betrayed that he was shaken. With a shattering force, the fourth blow landed on Iramamoe's chest, it reverberated like the rocks that tumbled down the river during a storm. I believe I heard his hikuras, I said. Certain Iramamowe's rib had been broken. 
He he's Y Terry. The Itiko Terry and their guests shouted in unison. With rapt expressions on their faces, they bounced up and down on their haunches, clacking their bows and arrows over their heads. Yes, he is a brave one, Hayama repeated, her eyes fixed on Ira Mamoe, who, satisfied that his hikuras had resounded potently, stood erect amidst the cheering men, his bruised chest puffed up with pride. Silencing the onlookers, the head man, Arasue, stepped toward his brother. Now you take Ira Mamoe's blow, he said to the young man who had delivered the four punches. The visitor positioned himself in the same defiant stance in front of Ira Mamoe. Blood spilled from the young man's mouth as he collapsed to the ground after receiving Ira Mamoe's third blow. Ira Mamoe jumped in the air, then began to dance around the fallen man. Sweat glistened on his face, on the strained muscles of his neck and shoulders, but his voice sounded clear, vibrant with joy, as he shouted, Ai, 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 ai. Two of the visiting women carried the injured man into the empty hammock next to where Hayama and I sat. One of them cried. The other bent over the man and began to suck blood and saliva from his mouth until his breath came in slow, measured gasps. Ira Mamoe challenged another of the guests to strike him. After receiving the first punch, he knelt on the ground, from where he dared his opponent to hit him once more. He spat blood after the next blow. The guest got down on his haunches, facing Ira Mamoe. Wrapping their arms around each other, they embraced. You hit well, Ira Mamoe said, his voice a barely audible whisper. My hikuras are full of life, potent and happy. Our blood has flown. This is good. Our sons will be strong. Our gardens and the fruits in the forest will ripen to sweetness. The guests voiced similar thoughts. Vowing eternal friendship, he promised Ira Mamoe, a machete he had acquired from a group of Indians who had settled near the big river. I have to watch this one more closely, Hayama said, walking out of the hut. Her youngest son was one of the men who had stepped into the circle for the next round of ritual blows. I did not want to remain with the injured visitor in Ira Mamoe's hut. The two women who had brought him in had left to ask the shaman from their own group to prepare some medicine that would ease the pain in the man's chest. My head began to spin as I stood up. Slowly, I walked through the empty huts until I reached Ituas. I stretched in my cotton hammock. An eerie silence closed in on me, as if I were falling into a light faint. I was awakened by angry shouts. Someone said, Itua, you have slept with my woman without my permission. The voice was so close, it was as if he had spoken into my ear. Startled, I sat up. A group of men and giggling women had gathered in front of the hut. Itua, standing perfectly still in the middle of the crowd, his face an unreadable mask, did not deny the charge. Suddenly he shouted, You and your family have eaten like hungry dogs for the last three days. It was a deplorable accusation. Visitors were given whatever they asked. For during a feast, the host's gardens and hunting territory 
were at their guest's disposal. To be insulted in such a manner implied that the man had taken advantage of his privileged status. Ritimi, get me my nabrushi, Itua shouted, scowling at the angry young man in front of him. Sobbing, Ritimi ran into the hut, picked up the club, and without looking at her husband, handed the four-foot-long stick to him. I can't watch, she said, throwing herself into my hammock. I put my arms around her, trying to comfort her. Had it not been that she was so distressed, I would have laughed. Not in the least concerned with Itua's infidelity, Ritimi was afraid the night might end with a serious fight. Watching the two angry men shout at each other and the crowd's excited reaction, I could not help but be alarmed in turn. Hit me on the head, the enraged visitor demanded. Hit me, if you're a man. Let's see if we can laugh together again. Let's see if my anger passes. We are both angry, Itua shouted with insolent vigor, hefting the Nabrushi in his hand. We must appease our wrath. Then, without further ado, he delivered a solid whack on the man's shaven tonsure. Blood gushed from the wound. Slowly it spread over the man's face until it was covered like some grotesque red masks. mask. His legs shook, almost buckling under him, but he did not fall. Hit me, and we'll be friends again, Itua shouted belligerently, silencing the aroused crowd. He leaned on his club, lowered his head, and waited. When the man struck him, Itua was momentarily dazed. Blood flowed down his brow and lashes, forcing him to close his eyes. The explosive yells of the men broke the silence. A chorus of approving shouts demanding they hit each other again. With a mixture of fascination and disgust, I watched the two men facing each other. Their muscles were drawn tightly, the veins in their necks distended, their eyes bright, as if rejuvenated by the raging flow of blood. Their faces, set in contemptuous red masks, betrayed no pain as they stepped around one another like two injured cocks. With the back of his hand, Itua wiped the blood, obstructing his vision, then spat. Lifting his club, he let it fall on his opponent's head, who without uttering a sound collapsed on the ground. Clicking their tongues, their eyes a bit out of focus, the spectators emitted fearsome cries. I was certain a fight would break out as the whole Shabono filled with their ear-piercing yells. I held on to Ritimi's arm and was surprised that her tear-strained face was set in a complacent, almost cheerful expression. She explained that she could tell by the tone of the men's shouts that they were no longer concerned with the initial insults. All they were interested in was to witness the power of each man's hikuras. There were no winners or losers. If a warrior fell, all it meant was that his hikuras were not strong enough at the moment. One of the onlookers emptied a water-filled calabash on the prostrate guest, pulled his ears, wiped the blood from his face. Then, helping him up, he handed the half-dazed man his club and urged him to hit Itua once more on the head. The man had barely enough strength to lift the heavy stick. 
instead of landing on Etuwa's skull. It struck him in the middle of the chest. Etuwa fell to his knees. Blood spilled from his mouth, over his lips, chin, and throat. Down his chest and thighs, a red trail seeping into the earth. <clears throat> How well you hit, Etuwa said in a strangled voice. Our blood has flown. We are no longer troubled. We have calmed our wrath. Ritimi went to Etua, sighing loudly. I lay back in my hammock and closed my eyes. I had seen enough blood for the night. I probed the swollen area on my head, wondering if I had a slight concussion. I almost fell from my hammock as someone held on to the liana rope, tying it to one of the poles in the hut. Startled, I looked up into Itua's bloodied face. Either he did not see me or was beyond caring where he rested, for he just slumped on top of me. The odor of blood, warm and pungent, mingled with the acrid smell of his skin. Repelled and fascinated, I could not help but stare at the open gash on his skull, still bleeding and his swollen purple chest. I was wondering how I could extricate my legs from under his weight when Ritimi stepped into the hut, carrying a water-filled gourd, which she heated over the fire. Expertly, she lifted Etua halfway up and motioned me to slip behind him in the hammock so that she could prop him against my raised knees. Gently, she washed his face and chest clean. Etua was perhaps twenty-five, yet with his hair clinging damply to his forehead, his lips slightly parted, he looked as helpless as a child in sleep. It occurred to me that he might die of internal injuries. He will be well tomorrow, Ritimi said as if she had guessed my thoughts. Softly she began to laugh. Her laughter had a ring of child, childishly secret delight. It's good for blood to flow. His hikuras are strong. He is Waiteri. Itua opened his eyes, pleased to hear Ritimi's praise. He mumbled something unintelligible as he gazed into my face. Yes, he is Waiteri. I agreed with Ritimi. Tutimi arrived shortly with a dark, hot brew. What is that? I asked. Medicine, Tutimi said, smiling. She stuck her finger in the concoction, then put it against my lips. Puriwariwe made it from roots and magical plants. A gleam of contentment shone in Tutemi's eyes as she forced Itua to drink the bitter-tasting brew. Blood had flown. She was convinced she would bear a strong, healthy son. Ritimi examined my legs, which were cut and bruised from being dragged across the clearing by Puri Wariwe, and washed them with the remaining warm water. I lay down in Itua's uncomfortable fiber hammock. The moon, circled by a yellow haze, had moved until it was almost over the horizon of trees. A few men were still dancing and singing in the clearing. Then a cloud hid the moon, obscuring everything in sight. Only the sound of voices, no longer shrill, but a gentle murmur, told that the men were still there. The moon revealed itself once more, a pale light illuminating the tops of the trees 
and the brown-skinned figures materialized against the darkness. Shadows of long bodies given substance to the soft clacking of bows and arrows. Some of the men sang until a rim of light began to appear over the trees to the east. Dark purple clouds, the color of Itua's bruised chest, covered the sky. Dew shone on the leaves, on the fringe of the palm fronds hanging around the huts. The voices began to fade, drifting away on the chilly breeze of dawn.